Just to begin, a uh, in quick introduction for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mike Krejci, I'm the manager of our Team Alberta program. And uh, on behalf of Hockey Alberta, wanted to welcome everyone to the uh, Alberta Built Elite uh, Fall Webinar Series. But uh, for anyone who's in Red Deer today, this we might as well call it the Winter Series since, uh, since all the snow has fallen today. Um, quick housekeeping notes, uh, Barry's presentation will be anywhere from 45 to 60 minutes this evening uh, with a Q&A period at the end. For anybody who has any questions throughout the session, uh, please use the question and answer function. Uh, with that, uh, this man needs no introduction and I've said too many nice things publicly about him the last couple of weeks. So um, Barry Midori, a high performance coach mentor for Hockey Alberta and tonight's topic on how to keep your players engaged. So with that, Barry, uh, I'll turn it over to you. Just uh, make sure that everybody can see the uh, the screen. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm getting better at uh, at this technology. Mike gives me a hard time all the time about uh, as you get older, you get a little less wise when it comes to technology and uh, a lot to end up learning as it goes. Well, welcome. Like Mike said, it's Tuesday night. Uh, what else would we rather be doing than uh, learning a little bit more about hockey? I know the past five or six months, I put a lot of time into webinars and reading and lots of things just because of what we're accustomed to. Uh, there's been a big changeover. And as a result, we've all ended up having to adapt. Uh, it's the first time I've been in Red Deer in the office since uh, the, the day that COVID was uh, introduced to us way back in March. So it was really exciting for me. It's the first time I've actually got to work around people. And I think I spent most of the day just catching up with everybody as far as what's going on here at the office. <clears throat> like many of you as coaches, and you might have kids as well that are playing, you probably do, but my three grandsons started playing a few weeks ago. And uh, the chagrin for me is um, I hear about what they've done and I see the odd video, but I'm not allowed to go into the rinks because you're only allowed one one person per family in to watch and certainly working with Hockey Alberta I don't want to be talking out of both sides of my mouth and uh, and going in or sneaking in or whatever else when when I shouldn't be so that's been a tough part for me. Um, the focus uh, tonight we were talking maybe a month ago about uh, doing a series for for coaches in Alberta so we came up with a number of different ideas and over the next well tonight weeks anyways we have three different topics that I hope of interest to you and hopefully we can help you out a little bit with your planning and process season goes on because it has been a little bit different. Um, what I really want to focus on tonight and I, I listened to Marty St. Louis here a while ago on a podcast and he really caught me when he said his whole career and if you follow it where he started and where he ended up as a Hall of Famer and everything he started out as not even a fourth liner in the NHL, but everything that he did, he, he did because he wanted to get really good at getting better. And I thought for us tonight, that was a great way to sort of call this topic because we, we are in a, in a state of change. And it's really important for us to end up remembering that as to how important it is <clears throat> that, that we're out there for the players, but we're also there for ourselves. I tease Mike all the time at the office and Kendall, uh, about the fact that my job first and foremost is is the coaches, not the players, and they give it to me all the time. But at, at the end of the day, uh, it is for the players. But we need to be at our best to help our players get to their best. And and I think what we need to end up recognizing right now is that we have an opportunity uh, as we end up uh, going through what we are now. We're in, in stage two, so we are allowed to play a few games. We got to take couple weeks off between so there's that whole scheduling thing we've got cohort groups uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. so it's been a huge change for us I don't know if you've read the book who moved my cheese if you haven't you probably should because it really is tolerance for uncertainty um, it's all about four mice that are in a maze so I threw the corn maze on the right hand side to sort of get you into that mood and then a whole bunch of things on the left hand side the change is going to happen 
we need to anticipate it, we need to monitor it, and these mice, as the story goes, go through all of these things, and then adapt to the change quickly. So when things start to happen and things move and you're out of your comfort zone, we have to be able to adapt and then change and then enjoy it wherever it ends up happening to get to um, and then continue to enjoy it again and again. So that's sort of the premise of the book. But I thought really important for us to recognize tonight that that's what it's all about. That's what we're, we're trying to end up managing ourselves in our daily life, but also in the life uh, of our hockey and our hockey team as we end up going. I, I believe firmly in most presentations I've ever done, at some point I put in there, you got to start with the end in mind. And what's it going to look like? Are we going to be optimistic uh, about these changes? Are we going to look to connect with our players and be more creative and all of those sorts of things? Or are we going to go the other way and be negative and be ticked off that we don't have enough games and our practices are here and things have changed and kids can't come out for the 14 days because maybe they did test positive and have to stay at home. So it really does start with us. And as John Wooden said, a great coach can end up changing a life, but it's not going to happen overnight. Uh, you can see on the left-hand side there, there's a set of stairs and it's sort of one step at a time. We, we can't go from A to Z all at once, uh, but we have to know that there is a top. Uh, there is a summit that we're trying to get to. And what does that look like for us at the end of the year? And what is success going to spell for us uh, when we're finished at the end of this year? I put this on, and I, I don't know if you can read uh, all of them, but I, I found this in an article that I read, and I thought it was really important to share with you because I'm going to talk tonight about the three buckets. And one of the buckets is a mental one and how important it is for us to recognize and understand where our kids are going through this. And not only the kids, but the parents as well, because there's so many things that they're used to uh, that they're not going to end up getting this year. And there's things that they're used to that they're gonna get more of because you have more time in your hands to be able to offer it to them. Um, you know, so the very first question mark there is what things can I control versus what things can't I control? We're going to talk a little bit about that tonight, but at the end of the day, really, we need to help them to answer that question and get them to understand there's certain things this year, guys or girls, that we're just not going to be able to control. So what can I do to support myself so that I'm going to come out of it stronger and better? Um, and you go all the way to the, to the very last one, what positive qualities do I have that might help me cope with the current conditions? Well, throughout the presentation tonight, I'm going to try and help and share with you some of the things that you can highlight to them, some of the things that you can teach to them, and hopefully maybe I'll twig your interest that maybe it's some things that you're going to have to learn to start to do and to be able to deliver. I've had the opportunity in hockey, it's just been an honor to, to be part of it, and I owe so much uh, of, the, of my life to the game. And one of the things I got to go over to Scandinavia, uh, Finland more often than not, and learn a whole lot from them. And they came over when I was operating a skill academy. And one of the things that I found from them is that they, they as coaches, never had fear of teaching something or of learning something new. And if you can see and believe that in the last 10 years, they've come from a, a team in, in world championships, no matter what level, from you know finishing anywhere from third to five or six, to suddenly now they're a world power. Well, one of the big reasons is because their coaches are not afraid to step out of their comfort zone and learn new things and be prepared to help their kids to get to the next levels. So I'm really hoping again tonight that I can share and, and maybe tweak a little bit of your interest in some of these areas. <clears throat> Excuse me. So COVID, is it an opportunity or a thunderbolt? And a thunderbolt, obviously, uh, I started, I coined the phrase years and years ago, but it's something that happens it's not planned for. Well, COVID hasn't been planned for. I think the world knew at some point that, you know, there was going to be some things happen that weren't going to be good. We didn't recognize and realize it was going to be this big a one, but is it an opportunity or a threat? <clears throat> so we want to, and I, talking with coaches and putting this presentation together, Ali Benfeld and I were talking and she's coaching at, at Olds College, at the female team there. And one of the things that she said uh, that really stuck with me is they had to meet their players where they were at when they came in at the beginning of this year. And I think it's really important for us to recognize that, that every child coming in, every player 
is going to be in a different spot. So we have to try and meet each one of them. Now, you guys have had three weeks or a month of getting to know your kids. The player selection and all of that for most of you is probably already gone. But again, when we train them off ice on ice, they don't have all the same skill sets. So we got to meet them where they're at. We want to, and in this case here, the importance, because we're not playing as many games and the way that it's organized with the schedules is different. We have to somehow find a way to maintain the excitement for them. We really want, I think, the biggest piece here for an opportunity is growth and development of both us and them uh, and the relationship side of it. We, we had at, e, at uh, Hockey Alberta for years and years, E3, every child, every time, uh, every day. And that emotional engagement with them is super important, and especially now, because we don't know what's going on in their household. We don't know what's going on at school. Uh, they might be in a class that they've been sent home because of things, or they may have to go get a test. We don't know that. So the more we can engage with them, the better off it is. We need to let them know that we're there to help them to have fun. I didn't put fun, I put enjoyment, because we need them to enjoy every time that they come to the rink or they go to the gym or wherever you're doing things with them. We have to learn an opportunities for us to be more creative. Um, we have to learn how to, how to get more compete out of the players. I could go into tons of stuff in the last three or four years that I've learned from teams at the high performance level that I've worked with but at the end of the day, kids today just don't know how to compete like they used to. So we have to bring that out in them. And now is a perfect opportunity for us to help them. And especially with less games, they have to be more hungry uh, when they go and in practices. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about some themes as well. So there's uh, um, another program out. It's called the Jungle Tiger. And it talks about um, uh, being in that comfort zone or non-comfort zone. And the tiger on the left is in the zoo. He's in his comfort zone. He doesn't have to worry about anybody hunting him down. He doesn't have to worry about his meal. Somebody's providing it. So everything is taken care of for him. Think about putting that tiger into on the right-handed slide where suddenly he's got to get better because he's going to go out into the jungle where now he's facing dangers and everything else. And I think that's our task with a lot of this that's been going on. We've been in that comfort zone on the left. And suddenly we're placed on the one in the right with that jungle tagger thing. And we've got to figure ways out of it to survive and thrive as we end up going. <clears throat> Excuse me. So now what? Um, th there's a book uh, that Zander, Benjamin Zander wrote years ago called The Art of Possibility. And it talked about um, teaching kids and teaching people that that's where we want to end up getting to. And it relates to imagery. And if any of you use that in your coaching, how important that is for players to be able to imagine and be creative with it. So having set that goal, that imagery piece, and then you're working your way towards it. Steve Hamilton coached Team Pacific uh, one year that, uh, that I mentored. And uh, his whole thing was accomplish the imagine. He had the players at the beginning of the, the summer camp um, close their eyes and think about when we won the gold medal, and it was, I believe, in Winnipeg that year, how would it feel? How would they feel? Who would be the first person they would talk to? So we went a whole bunch, a whole bunch of different imagery thoughts with the players. And throughout the whole process, accomplish the imagined is what he talked about. Uh, we lost the gold medal that year to the U.S. in the final, but on the blue line and then after in the dressing room, we went through that whole procedure again, and it was pretty cool. But again, we planted that seed of accomplish the imagine. Uh, the bottom picture of the, the ripples is us in the middle. And everything that we do is going to have a ripple effect on our players this year and our parents. And I think this presentation, there's a little bit that you should take away that you're going to be thinking about your parents because they're in the same spot as the kids. Bruce Lee did something years ago. You could go online and and uh, and take a look at it on YouTube, but it's uh, it's about be like water. And he talked about water as being very powerful, very slow. It adapts to its environment, etc. And I think at the end of the day, as coaches, that's a great message for us. If we're if we be like water, and we recognize that we're in the middle, and those ripples are our players and our trying to work with, how can we accomplish dear? Uh, with having that as sort of a starting point. Things that you can control and what should you focus on. And so in this diagram here, I just tried to put a few things in there, but really things that matter to us should be that we're going to give our 
comfortable season that we can, uh, no matter what level, uh, no matter if we're coaching male or female, but whatever, but we want to give them the best possible opportunity. So you want to know your players. You want to teach them and treat them with fairness, respect, and trust. You want to be straight up with communication with them in all aspects. Transparent. You want to serenity. And what that means really, there is going to be ups and downs. There are going to be frustrated with things that they can't do in practice or that there's not enough games or they're not getting more a hundred other things. What can we do to maintain that serenity? And then on the left is sustain optimism. How important that is that we, we as leaders don't show any chinks in our armor and we sustain that optimism throughout the whole uh, year as it ends up unfolding. So the environment for success, we always talk about different buckets. Coaches that are in our programs, you got the three buckets, technical, physical, and mental. How much would you put into each one of those buckets when you're looking at a, at a team and you're looking at players and you're looking at the whole year? And there's not really a right or a wrong answer because all of us are built a little bit different um, and we're wired a bit different. Some of us might put a little bit more into the technical side and a little bit less into the other two. And it could go any one of the three ways. There's really not a right or wrong, but honestly, you need to put as much into the mental one as you do the other two, uh, even if you're wired a bit different. And again, I'm hoping as a presentation goes on that I'm gonna show you the importance of it. And especially in a year like this, where again, with all the changes that have happened, we have to help these kids and parents through this whole process. <clears throat> I think it's critical, and I talked a little bit earlier about the communication piece, that we really connect with our players. We build those relationships, and we really learn how to give feedback. Wally Kozak taught me a number of years ago this little saying, and it stuck with me, right time, right amount, and right stuff. So when should you say something, what should you say, and how much should you say? And sometimes after a shift, if a player and he's made a mistake, less might be more. Uh, and you see it might be a little bit different. You'll probably notice that every slide that I have me in the past or heard me before, I have purpose with everything that I do. It takes me a long time to put these together. It may not seem like it. Um, and maybe it's only mediocre, the, the PowerPoint itself. But the two pictures there, what I wanted to depict is no matter whether you're at a practice or you're at a game, that connectedness and that feedback needs to be there in order for you to build those relationships with your players. And I really think that that's paramount and even more so this year. <laughs> Excuse me, so when you're planning for your year, and I, talking with Dan Basterash maybe a month ago, uh, they were running a practice in Edmonton, a, a selection camp, and we're talking and Dan threw it by us that, you know, like, back then we didn't know what the schedule was all about but he made the comment about well, what do we do if we we're going to have this time off in between and that was all the trigger that we needed uh, Kendall and I went back and talked and then we got Mike involved with it as well to put all these together but that was a manifestation of why we're doing what we're doing and that's why this first presentation is the way that it is is what can we do so I'm going to try and give you a few tips on some scheduling stuff uh, on some uh, some stuff with skill development on building a culture and the mental well-being. So again, it's relating to uh, the three buckets. Um, when I ran a skills academy years ago in Spruce Grove, that puck on the right-hand side had a lot to do with the way that I looked at everything and, and helped my staff uh, in developing a, a year plan for both on and off ice. And back then, we didn't have the kids on for 20 times and then off for 10 but they were split, so they'd go one on and one off, and the parents at the start of it, the years, would always, especially new ones, would say, well, why are we paying for kids to be off ice almost as much as being on? And so I had to teach them back then that there's a mental aspect and there's also a skill transfer and a physical transfer off ice. So if we taught toe drags on ice, we wanted to do them off ice as well so that they learned how to do it even more. And we ended up going back and forth to both. So we, we built up the mastery side. And it stuck with me all the years now that I've worked with Hockey Alberta and Hockey Canada that that's how we end up needing to do our planning is we're, we're looking to do things 
in unison that what we're doing on ice relates to the off ice component as well. <clears throat> so building a style of play um, to me is the first thing as a coach that you need to look at. And you probably all started it. You selected your players. So you've got an idea of how you want them to play the game uh, based on their skill level and based on your philosophy and vision. And I, I put three books down here that to me make such a difference. Bill Walsh, when he took over in San Francisco were horrible, but his whole philosophy was take care of everybody that's in within the organization, treat them with respect and let them go out and play and do their job, whether it was the field maintenance, whether it was a secretary or the football players, well, the score takes care of it or it takes really related to his philosophy and they won a number of Super Bowls because of it. Blown Away is a book that's just come out the last couple years. Outstanding book on philosophy, DNA, and a winning culture of a, a coach that came in that nobody knew about. A couple years transformed that team into a world power uh, just on a few basic principles and concepts. Um, one was on ball management and the second one was on the five second rule. If they lost ball management, uh, which meant that they had to have 100 passes in a row without the other team touching the ball, they automatically went back to protect the house. So it was a defense first, but they still pressured the ball coming back. And those two things alone propelled that team. And he did a bunch of other things that he talked about in building the culture. But again, to me, it was building a style of play that he wanted. And if you've never read Shackleton's book, you need to. I, I did it through COVID. And it was an amazing story about leadership and how a man got a group of people that were put away for, I don't know, 120 days and 40 below weather with very little to eat and everything, how he led them uh, from the beginning to the end of it uh, and made everything the way that it was. So an incredible book. And then just recently, the, the um, YouTube put out, or pardon me, Netflix put out the coach's uh, notebook and the one coach on there, hold fast, stay true, really stuck with me that when you build a style of play, whatever it is, hold fast to those values that you have and stay true to them. And they'll make a world of difference for you when you're building your team this year and your culture. <clears throat> so the first bucket we're going to look at is a technical one. And Simon Sinek put out the little circle on the left. You need to know your why before you can do your how and what. So the why gives you the motivation, the how gives you the process, how you're going to do it, and then the what is a product that you're going to go through. And I think really important when we talk about practices, uh, that they're themed, that they're deliberate, uh, that we're very creative in how we, how we put them together, and then we have compete in them. Like I say, the kids of today, that bottom one is so important uh, for them to get the most out of it. So the four... Um, I, I think some mindset when we're looking at that technical bucket of practice, the importance of how we want to work to develop them instead of just putting drills in there because we now have the time and hopefully the opportunity to really build good practices that are going to help have them motivated uh, and get a great product coming out. So with tools for a better practice, um, the the uh, little diagram is kind of a cool one where it's just right in the middle and it could be too easy or it could be too hard. So what we want to do to start with when we're building a practice, the first thought that comes to mind is learn skills in the context, we'll use them. And the term linking has come out uh, a number of years ago. Um, I started using it after reading some stuff and linking means uh, you're linking skills to drills to practice the game. And the, the word's uncertainty, so we want to end up using them. We want the players to be a little bit uncertain. We want things to be unpredictable, and we definitely want to put pressure on them. Now, do we need to do that right off the hop? No. But we want to end up linking those things to whatever we're going to do. Um, two years ago at the Under-17 Worlds, uh, again, I know guys from Finland and a couple of them were over the head coach and I was talking with him the one night and his team, I watched them practice the first practice and I thought these guys could win the event. They're that good. And I asked them what they were doing different now. 
And he said, we do deliberate practice, and I'll show you what that means in a minute. But he said, then we go right to pressure. Everything we do has pressure in it. And what it does is it makes our players have to have hockey sense better, have their skills develop more, and be able to go at a fast pace right off the hop. Well, I guess I was a good predictor because they won the tournament that year. They were incredibly good. And no matter what kind of pressure the other teams put on them, uh, they were not bending to it. We want practices to have desirable difficulties. And again, that's that comfort zone thing, the right amount of hard and the right type of hard. So not too much and different types of hard to end up making it in our practice to make them better. And certainly we want to stay out of autopilot. And basically what that means is spacing things. Don't give them five drills in a row that are all going to tear the energy away from them. They've got nothing left. Nor do we want to give them all slow, deliberate stuff and just teaching things. So we want to space out the drills that we're doing and what we're doing with it. And we want to give them variation. And so the next little the number of slides, I'm going to talk a little bit about some variation that you can have in your practices. And hopefully these are things that will resonate with you. And uh, as you move on, you'll be able to, uh, to adapt some of it to what you're doing now. The first one, and I wasn't sure because of the level that you guys are coaching, if you're working with one team or two teams on the ice and how you're doing that. So I just took a bit of a guess, but the first one is with ice utilization. And notice at the top, I drew a line down the middle with some pylons down the middle. And there's blue at one end, red at the other. Well, you can do full ice drills with two groups or two teams by splitting the ice that way. And it works very well. Uh, the only thing you're losing out on is maybe a breakout to start with. So typically with this stuff, you might start out in the middle with some transition pieces or entries. But you still get a whole end to work with. And to me, especially if you're practicing with two teams or you want to split, and maybe you want to work forwards with one and D with the other, but that's an excellent way to, to split your ice up. Uh, the bottom one, I just put in there an idea if you want to have a whole bunch of different stations in a practice, and you guys probably all are doing that uh, with it, and I'll talk about that in a minute too, but just an idea there where you can work on skating, shooting, puck handling, passing, and putting all of that into a small area game, that linking piece all in one practice and just move the guys around or girls around to the station. And whether you did the four stations and then the small area game at the end, or you had that as one of the five stations. But what I wanted to show you is creativity here with you is so important for us. It's just one team and, and one practice. Use all the ice and use it. Uh, ability be creative with it. Um, the purposeful planning part, and if you read at the top, uh, elite performers engage in what we can best be called practice, uh, specifically designed to improve individual target practice. And so what I tried to do here, and I don't know if you can see my mouse, but the first one on the left is a deliberate practice, um, just using some pylons. So all we're doing there is doing edge control. And we've got groups at each end uh, lined up that are skating through the pylons and doing what we want them to do, whether it's toe drags, whether it's 360s, no matter what it is, but it's deliberate, it's slow, it's teachable. Uh, then you go to the second um, diagram in the middle where it's random, and they're doing the same skills. The pylons are placed in that end, but there's more players that are skating around those pylons. There's more speed and there's no deliberacy to it. And that's a term called random. So we're actually teaching some hockey sense or hockey IQ, and a little bit maybe with the intangible piece with courage, especially if you were to do that drill uh, with a whistle control, speed up, slow down, uh, transition skate on the whistle, uh, go backwards through the pylons, give and go, whatever it happens to be, but you're being creative with that random group. So suddenly that deliberacy goes to a random part of it. And then the third one is where you, you're working with a group of players, and every team's going to have it where you have some really highly skilled players and you have some that maybe aren't as highly skilled. So if you go back to the last one with working in the station work, um, I won't go back, but where, you know, one group, when you're working with, say, a, a group in a passing drill sequence at the top, they're doing it deliberate. They're doing it only two people in it, whereas at the bottom where you're going to a progression where you've got a whole bunch of players in there, uh, working as partners and a whole bunch of pylons 
And again, you've progressed that skill to make it faster, make it harder, make it more complicated. But again, those concepts, deliberate to random and regress to progress, makes a huge difference in how you're going to plan for a practice and what you're going to end up putting in it. You could have one drill and you could add little things to it over and you don't need to really that much. They always know it's Barry's drill. It's in this end. Here's where the pucks go. Here's how we start adding this piece to it. So you're saving time. You're not going to the rink board. And notice I called it by my name. I've done enough of these sessions, maybe more with younger coaches where you say you give every kid in the team a drill and they need to know what the drill is and how to, again, you're saving time. You're making them have to think about it ability and leadership on their part and at the end of the day your practice flows that much quicker this is really important in my mind um, hopefully you can read my writing as well so purposeful planning goes to some other things as well and you know to skill drill practice the game how important that is so you can go when you're working planning where you do technical stuff and technical meaning all the skills that you want that uh, in the, um, and notice I did there with the skills I you can do forwards D goalies you could do the whole team you could just do individual with all of those sorts of things. it's critically important for you to, to recognize that station work has been around for a long time but if you put the time into it you do some research and you think about what your players need man can you do a lot of good stuff with ice utilization and just using this concept with a technical side. My one grandson is, <clears throat> excuse me, playing uh, in Edmonton and uh, he's novice, uh, second or third year, whatever. And uh, he's working with a, a coach that's played in the NHL and the guy is very good. There's no question about it. He sent stuff out to his parents and that has been really good. But after each set of drills and he does three stations at a time, on half ice, he blows a whistle and the kids all have to skate hard. My son's one of the coaches and I have a hard time and eventually I'll get the right time to tell him about skills between drills. So instead of doing that two hard laps with no purpose at all, unless you want it to be conditioning, put something in there. Do an edge control. Every time I blow the whistle, you turn and go the other direction and carry a puck. And what I want you to do is one accelerated stride out of each turn. The next time it's partner passing. The next time it's forward to backward skating with a puck. But if you put that into that technical part of your planning side, a skill between a drill, and think about it, you're doing six to eight drills in a practice. You've now worked on six or seven or eight different skills within that practice that require only 30 to 40 seconds. You can start setting up your board for the next drill, then bring them in to get a drink, and away they go after that. So to me, critically important when we're looking at that practice planning. That tactical piece, we're all going to put pieces in it because the level that you're coaching, you are going to put that stuff in it. Don't make that the focus of all your practice and every practice. It's almost too easy in a way to teach those skills. And this year with less games, I think it's more important to focus on the skill side of it and give them some principles to play by. And don't worry so much about the tactics. But who's fooling who? We are going to want to put some of it in it. I don't know if any of you have seen circuits before, but that would be, and I did have a whole bunch of slides that I was going to show when I changed my mind. A circuit really is using the amount of ice that you have, putting in all the skills that you are using in the stations and that that you want, and maybe a tactic as well in it, and having them skate through it. And circuits, if you ended up doing up the ice, down the ice, up and back down like four pieces or even three or two, you're going to get a ton of work in. You're going to get them to work a little bit on their, excuse me, <clears throat> on their conditioning. You're going to get them to work on all the skills that you want them to all at once. And really, you don't have to blow one whistle. It's almost if you use PEP, it would be similar to a PEP program, except you have the ability to put in what you want when you want. And it's not just all about puck handling. <clears throat> Champions, uh, that one there is just races between two players or four players or however you want but typically it's two players you line them up one on each goal line they skate out around the top of the blue line and back in they race for a puck they do crossovers at the circle they skate backwards to the blue line but that's where you're building in again some conditioning and especially with those ones it's a lactic 
uh, anaerobic alactic, which means you don't, you're not going to give them a ton of them. And they're really working on that one uh, energy system that very seldom we work on. And that's why they don't have a whole lot of room for that seven to eight seconds too many times in a game. Champions also build that compete in the players. And again, when you're doing that, if you purposefully plan, if you're going to compete with it and you have winners and losers, uh, you, I, you, you win or you learn. You don't lose. So what are you learning when you're not winning? Maybe you got to be able to be a better skater or work a little bit harder or whatever else. Champions, to me, are an excellent way to finish practices and get that compete level out in them. The conditioning, you can put that right into skills where you might do a flow drill that's got them going down, coming back. And it's actually <clears throat> that, that there's a two-on-one continuous. It's a great one. Those are lots of you probably have used it. And that one to me is a great conditioning, but a skill drill where they're working on two-on-ones, both defending as well as attacking. And they're having to go down the ice hard and then back checking, coming back the other way. That would be an example of a conditioning skill drill. <clears throat> Excuse me. Building in small area games. And I think that's where you put everything that you've learned in a practice that you want to into a game and you make the, the rules relate to what you want. So you can only score on a backhand. You can only score from a one-timer. You have to puck manage. That means either stick handling around somebody or using your body to protect the puck before you can make a play. Any of those sorts of things work. You put in time. So like 20 seconds. So it's a time shift that you want them to go 20 or 30 seconds hard. So you're working on, uh, that part of it, line changes when they when the whistle goes, they're out hard and the next group is in hard. So you're working those things, the habit side of it. And again, small area games are so good for it. You notice on the right-hand side that there's a, um, a poster and it says Genuine Green Gators. That was from a few years ago, a summer team. And there's another poster down further down. They all had team names. And then at the bottom between the two of them, uh, we kept a running total of everything they did on ice and off ice uh, that whole week of the selection camp in the summer. Uh, we tabbed it all up. So it was a team event, a team game. We had split the players into different teams, and they competed against one another. I think right now a better way for us to that I've talked about in practice planning into that now and highlight it. Make it evident when they come in. They're all old enough now. And if you use a slogan, uh, you either win or you learn. And you use that instead of winners and losers. So you're the learners or you're the winners. And make sure that players see it and make it important and make it valuable. You're going to gain tons of traction in your practices from it. And it's going to be a lot better to be able to sell the players to that energy level, to the compete level, to the learning level, and to them wanting to come to practices. And also, if you theme your practices, um, you've got 14 days between games. So Mondays is going to be skills day. And maybe you've got somebody that teaches skills that you've got coming out. Tuesday is going to be a, a skating day, like with edges and that, but we're also combining small area games with it. Wednesday is our special teams day and tactical day. But you can theme it that way as well, especially with the 14 days. The players know what they're going to get coming in. Uh, each session that they're coming into, and they're going to be excited about it. Uh, let's say, for example, a special teams day, because they're either power play or penalty kill, or they're both, and better yet, they're both. They get opportunity to compete against one another and, uh, and do both. So to me, lots and lots and lots of ideas with practices and how much fun we can have with them to make it competitive, to make it enjoyable, to give them the skill development that they need uh, to get to the next levels in their in their um, uh, in their in their um, development phases. So how you practice? Um, no matter how well planned we are, if you don't make this important, uh, you're losing out big time. And I've seen great practice plans that turn into mush because we don't hold kids accountable. We don't want them to execute properly. We allow bad habits to form. So offside, the net, not stopping at the net, not driving the net. How important those things are to us. Don't, don't forget you've got lots of time this year to be able to stop your practice and teach. You're teaching them that style of play that you want. You're teaching them culture by teaching them those three top things. 
execution is critically important. We need good habits, and I'm holding you accountable to it if you're not going to do it. But at the same time, we want to push them out of their comfort zone. So we want to use that, let's put pressure on them, let's force them to do things, let's get them to do it, but also to reinforce with them that it is because you fell more than once learning to walk, you didn't know how born, et cetera, et cetera. It's okay to fail, but fail first, fail hard, and fail forward. And all that means is the faster that you fail and failing forward means you're going to get up and go again. I think that's critical to how you practice. Don't let kids be afraid to make those mistakes. The video piece of it, um, I think there's a, a video or something coming up that I'll get into a little bit more and I'll cover it off in that part of it. So your practices. Um, John Wooden, I think, is critical over here in the left. That the, the, the filler of success of all of us is the ability to devise, meet the player's needs, really coordinate them into a daily practice program. If you've ever read anything by John Wooden, he always talks about it. He was, he was planned down to the minute. Him and I would have never gotten along because I'm random in my practices. I've got them all planned out, but if something's going well with it, or if it's not, I might continue. Because guess what? There's always tomorrow. You can always cover off what you didn't do today another time. What you want to do again is don't cheap out on something because of time's up. The other one that I've learned over time is if you know your players, they come in and they've got bad attitudes when they walk into the rink, don't start with what you planned on with a proper warm up or whatever. Get into a game. Give them something fun. Give them something to compete with so that they get the adrenaline going and then you can move into a proper practice. Again, you have to have that coach's feel for it and they have to understand that that's what they want to recognize coming out of it, how important that part is with it. Um, so don't be stoic with what you, you've planned. Have that ability to be flexible but also have a plan and be able to move on if it's not working out or to make the changes as it goes. I wanted to touch on games here. Um, what's important now? And I think you with your style of play uh, that you've got and what your values are with your team, that win is so important. Is it going to be with your bench management? Are you going to be coordinating time on ice with all players? Uh, how are you going to relate to the players and their roles and the opportunities that you're going to end up giving them? I've worked with too many high-performance teams at high levels, and coaches don't even recognize that some players' time on ice is 30 minutes and others is three. And it's no wonder parents are pissed off with them and the players quit on them. This is a year that you really have to manage your bench properly and wisely. You have to understand what's important now, that win concept, and it's win-win. Give all of your players a chance to play. Give them all a chance in the games that what you're working on in practice, they can try and gain. Here is not important to win a league champion. Too many other things. And honestly, if we don't do a good job as coaches this year with our players, not more of them, whether it's the other leagues or whether they just decide that hockey isn't for them and they're going to go and do something else. You have to recognize how important practice is, the are as well and how you manage that bench that purposeful strategy in it how you're going to end up going into it okay that's the on ice part of it so we finished that technical bucket so we're off to the off ice now and I talked about video uh, in your practices so the messiah method is another book if you haven't read it you should it talks about seven disciplines of a college soccer program and one of the seven that he that they talked about their winning record is like 950. They've won, I don't know how many national championships, male and female. That's why there's a girl and guy there at the top that have won. But one of their key things when they talk about practices, practice planning, they video every practice. And they also have the skills that are required to be a striker, to be a defender in the middle, to be a goalie, whatever else. They have all of those skills. And those are the things that they work on in practice. Now that's high level. But I wanted to bring it up to you that in order to get your kids better, those are things you need to be thinking about, is you've got to help them to get to the next level. So video will work, and then using it off ice to show them what they're doing or not doing, 
Um, a lot of teams that I've worked with, what we end up using them for is teaching moments, right? Things that they've done well in a power play, a PK, a four check or whatever, or individual things. Usually we don't do the individual, but just using video to help out. So off ice, you can also use classroom and you can use like the skill guy on the left. Uh, he's doing some skills on video prior to them going out onto the ice. Think of effective use of time, space, equipment, and people when you're working on your practice planning and your overall planning for this year, no matter what it is. And again, that picture there on the bottom right, we did that years ago. It was a Team Alberta team that we had to go from one rink to another, and it wasn't because of COVID. But how important that was for us to get the guys to buy in and accept it and have fun with it, uh, going to the rink that way. The team building, uh, put in both a male and female slide. This was our team, Alberta Canada Winter Games teams. You notice a couple key components there. In both cases, there's coach involvement and engagement. On the right, Mando is doing a time thing with the twister, and you've got a whole bunch of guys that are taking part in it. On the left-hand side, Craig is laying on the table, and the girls lifted him, and he was 200, and he's probably, if he's listening, going to be mad at me, but I'm going to say 220 at least and they all lifted him with one finger. And the whole thing there was, if everybody works together, you don't need a lot to go into it to end up making something work. And the girls couldn't believe it the first time they lifted him. But how important team building is for you guys and girls in a game this year to build in that stuff with the players. You've got the time to be able to do it now. And team building can happen on the ice as well as off in a practice or a game. Giving a high five is a team builder. Cheering is a, is a team builder. Um, putting them onto teams and competing is a team builder. Um, we have a team building booklet with Hockey Alberta. Lots of you have been through the program, but we really talk in team building about cooperation, trust, the building of them, building of leadership, uh, building of, um, of being able to solve problems together. All of those things relate to team building. And how important, again, this year, getting that connectedness with your players and getting them to work with one another uh, as the year ends up going on. So that's a really important part of the bucket. You're also looking at, and lots of you probably have a training program. And again, I put pictures on the right, whether it's working with skill development, whether it's working, and again, in the middle one, where kids are using hurdles and doing different things there. So they're working on um, their physical part of it or the stretch. The bottom picture shows the training principle and how are you doing it. Maintenance during the year is a key. You're not trying to build strength to maintain what the players have. And this is a great year to teach these kids of how to train properly and how to do things. And it's also one, like I said to you at the start, if you don't know a lot of try and get a hold of resources or uh, and best case scenario, maybe even to hire somebody that's going to help you pay attention, write notes, ask questions, be part of it, and have them take the players through the training side of it when it's the physical side. The top one with the walkthroughs, that's a no-brainer. That should be you guys doing it. And maybe you're going to start out really simple and you're going to get as it ends up going. And you can make a lot of that stuff into team building aspects as well as you go. Uh, Multi-sport, we tried years ago, um, and we do it every summer now at our summer camps. Uh, I work with the coaches on things that we do off ice. Everything relates to team building and it's also multi-sport. So we try to teach, as an example, you want to work on a power play off ice, well, you make a two-on-one game with a ball. And so you're teaching players how to move and to get into open spaces and cut in front and do all of those things, but you're using a basketball or a football or a Frisbee or whatever. So multi-sport is important. And I think now, again, this year, we have the opportunity to experiment and try different things with the kids. So I would suggest that you do some of that when you're doing off-ice stuff. That's the physical side of it. Now, heading on to the mental part of it, and to me, the one that I said at the beginning is really important, is the, the ability to me regulate thoughts, feelings, and behaviors in a consistent manner while coping with the many demands placed on him and I put, should have put but the aim of developing mental fitness, we want the best performance we can get from our players. We want quality training with them. We want them to be mentally, to have well-being in that side of it, and to develop mental toughness. And again, each one of those bullets, I could go into an hour-long presentation on it. But to just give you the idea that 
mental fitness relates to mental performance. And we are in a tough spot with these kids this year, and we might even be that as well with less games, more planning time, more practices. How can we maintain our and how important it is? So on the right, I put there a psych plan, uh, what to do, what to do if it doesn't work, why would we end up doing it? So helping the players to develop something that they can relate to. And maybe it's just a team thing that you go through every day before or after practice for 10 minutes. Hey, how are we doing? What do we do at school? What's our goal tonight? It can be something very simple to something that's very complex. Again, that's up to you. The rubber ball, if it's a full ball and it's a, like a beach ball and I drop it, it's going to bounce back to me, that Newton's third law of physics, because it's, it's full. But if the ball is half deflated, it's not always going to bounce back to me. And it's fully deflated, it's never going to bounce back. We want our players to be like that beach ball that's fully inflated. We want it so that it's going to come back to us all the time and it's going to be resilient to no matter what the challenges are that are ahead of us this year. Um, and again, depending on practices, games, et cetera, et cetera, there's going to be a lot of those challenges. How do we help them to end up coming out of it and getting better? So setting goals, I just put here, I think to me that the biggest thing with goal setting is get the players to log. What do they want to get better at? And if you even use the three buckets, a physical, a technical, and a mental one, and split it into those three things and ask them every time they come to a practice or an off-ice session, have them write down a goal under each one of them or the one that's applicable. At the end of it, they're going to start to see if they not only put what their goal is, but did they achieve it? and why they did or didn't, what their feelings were, like get them to write a little bit, they're going to start to figure it out that they want to do it, not that they have to do it. And once they start wanting to do it, they're going to start prioritizing what's important to them. Because the age that they're at, none of them have it made. They're, they didn't just sign an 8 million Taylor Hall contract for one year, but all, they would all probably want to do it or play for our national team or whatever. And they're not going to get there just on skill alone. They're going to get there by definite planning and organizing. And this is where you as coaches can end up helping them out. And I put a simple diagram down there on the left. If you're taking notes, hopefully you can write fast enough to get it down. I've still got a few slides to get through and time is running through here. But you want, to, you want goals. You know you're going to face adversity in those goals. So you're going to have to find a way to be flexible with it. What have you learned as you're going through the adversity piece? How are you adapting? So that toe drag that I wanted to work on today, uh, experience adversity, I got it taken away 15 times. What did I learn? I got to be quicker and more evasive. How am I going to adapt next practice? I'm going to work on edges a bit more. I'm going to, and then what action am I going to take? This is a really simple learning to perform uh, milestone goal setting with the logging piece. So the three buckets and that action plan would probably be all you need uh, to set your players up for some success. And then, like I say, if you do it with them before or after practice and games, and then talk to them about it, do some meetings, have meetings as part of your off-ice mental performance side of things with them, both group and individual ones, you're going to find it'll make a world of difference. You're going to get to know your players, which is another whole session all on its own with the type of players they are and you know, what are they? Are they a shark? Are they a fox or whatever? Learn more about them and they're going to learn more about themselves when it comes to the self-awareness piece. This one here to me is near and dear to my heart because I don't think we do enough of any of it to teach kids how to be leaders. We put a C on a kid, slap it on and think that they're going to be there and they're going to be great at it. Well, they're not. They're the most popular, they're the best player, they're the one that we need to pick because we'll lose them if we don't pick them. But what are we doing to help them out? Uh, Wally's got a mission statement thing that he uses and he uses a tree. And when people draw the tree, they forget the roots. And the roots are the most important part of it. And leadership is the most important part of all of this. Locker room that people believe in you, it starts with you, but it goes to the leaders on your team and how you can end up developing them to help the players in the room and to help you uh, to be a leaderful room. And whether it's with just leading team building, whether it's them 
giving messages back and forth, whether it's them telling you what's going on and building that trust relationship, ton of things go into it. But it's a route that's not the free and it gives purpose to us. It helps us with our culture. Uh, it certainly goes in with the people that we're engaged with and it helps with the process itself uh, when we want to talk about a culture. And leadership is, is service. Like you, you're, you're a leader on your team, you're a coach, you're providing service, you're paying it forward to them. And what that means, is it a me or a we? It can't be both. So if it's me, you're not winning in the locker room first. And if it's your players that are a bigger me than we, you're not winning in the locker room first. So we want to really work and engage our players into, into becoming leaders. There's lots of stuff out there. There's lots of literature um, that, that talks about how, how you can develop the leadership component within players, within the team. And to me, I put leaderful down there. I'd love every player to be a leader. And I could get into what we do provincially with our provincial teams to provide that where everybody gets to be part of the leadership group at some point or other. Uh, and when we go to our competitions, because to me, then everybody feels part of it. They're not neglected and left out. And it's not just up to a certain few people. So remember the tree and remember about winning in the locker room first with leadership. And hopefully that spurs you on to doing a little bit as the year goes on. Here's one that you probably don't think of, but by gosh, we're, we are, it's so important that we teach performance enhancement to our players. And again, the diagrams on the right, we need to teach them proper nutrition. And if we don't know it, go out and research it or bring somebody in that's gonna talk to them about it. And emerging high performance athletes do not eat well. They need to be taught how to eat properly or when they go to camps, when they go to events, they're gonna bonk. So to me, that's critical, the nutrition piece. The middle one we use, uh, the Hockey Alberta is a little bit different than the Hockey Canada one, but a P chart, the hydration piece. How many insist that your players at a practice bottle, and when they do anything off ice, they have a water bottle, and it's full when they start, and it's empty when they finish. They have a bottle before and a bottle after they're done so that they're properly hydrated, so they don't pee yellow. Because when they do, they lose a whole bunch of what they could be providing you and the rest of the team will be hydrated. And then the bottom one, the suppleness and rest and recovery, how important those are to performance enhancement. So we're not taking drugs, we're not doing any steroids, we're not doing anything at all, we're actually doing things that are good for our bodies, and we're resting them and recovering. And there's a ton of stuff now on sleep, and on recovery about rolling and stretching and all of that stuff that I think, again, we've got a year as coaches that we can use it to train ourselves to help our kids to become better at it. So at the end, um, every one of us has a team. Uh, every one of us has a jersey. And if you've read Legacy, that piece stuck with me is when I, when I finish at Hockey Alberta, I... Uh, I want to leave that jersey in a better place. Uh, there's, uh, there's a pride in us being a coach, in us being a leader, and us being a role model. And I think we owe it to the people that we work with and we owe it to ourselves that we are going to do the best job possible that we can this year to help our players and help ourselves get through it all. And if we work together and if we work hard and if we have a plan ourselves, personal development, and we help our players through it, those three buckets, uh, I think we're going to do wonders with our program. And I think a lot of us will realize that we don't need all those games. We can have more of a European style model of working with players and developing them so that someday uh, we had 23 players from Alberta this year drafted by the NHL. Uh, 10 of them were Team Alberta kids. And I can say with pride that all 23 of them, you guys had a part to play in it because I'm sure that you know one of them that you work with or that somebody that you know worked with one of them or more. And that's what we do. We're grassroots and we help our kids get to the next levels. And I think that's critical uh, as we go through uh, this year, uh, both with ourselves and our players. So I, I really want to thank you. Uh, Mike said it would be 45 minutes to an hour. Krejci, as usual, I'm one minute over. Uh, I apologize for that, uh, and I leave you with uh, the bottom piece there that to me really stands out.
use your resources. Thank you. We, start, we started late, so I'll give you the benefit of the doubt. Oh, so you're being nice to me. That's, that's pretty good. Yeah. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, just quickly, uh, there, I don't see any questions in the, in the Q and A or chat function. If you do, uh, here's your chance to ask. I'll give, give anybody who's got, who might want to ask a question a minute here. Oh, there we go. Will this be emailed out to everybody? Um, we're, we're working on how we're going to, uh, to get this out, whether we post this somewhere. So we will, uh, We'll get back to you on, on how we're going to distribute it. Question, Barry, team building book. How do we get a hold of one? Um, can we provide that as a resource? Uh, I will I will look I will look into it and see where we're at with yeah. with it. It's it is quite a large document. <laughs> And I'm not sure that we can actually email. So uh, we'll, we'll, we will work on maybe a condensed version of that to get out. To I, I think that's really a doable for the people that are on tonight. Yeah. We could put something together for sure. Yeah. Barry, I think you knocked this one out of the park. So um, with that, I just talked too much, Mike. Yeah. Thank you for everyone for, for jumping on tonight. Um, obviously different times right now with, uh, with COVID and, and working through a, a pandemic. So on behalf of Hockey Alberta, thank you to all you coaches who are doing uh, what you're doing. Um, please feel free to lean on, lean on our group if you, uh, you need anything or, or need some help or have any questions and uh, Want to wish you all the best and expect to see an email tomorrow about uh, next week's session. Um, as, we, as Barry mentioned, we'll be doing three of these this month and uh, potentially some more moving forward uh, as we get on to the winter months. Mike, if I could just butt in, if there's things sure. uh, for those of you that are still on, uh, if there's topics of relevance, um, that you feel that weren't covered or that could be covered more or that something that's right out of it that we're not providing, let us know so that we can take a look at it and see what we can do with it. Yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah. So any closing words, Barry? No, I think, uh, you know, I, I said it all. I, I really appreciate everybody being on tonight. Um, it, it was a long session. Uh, I found in, in listening all the time that I did that I gained something from it. So please take one thing away at least that you can help both yourself and your, and your athletes. And good luck as the season progresses. Hopefully I'm allowed into rink sooner than later and see some of you. Have a great evening, everyone. Thanks again. Yep. Thanks, everybody.